Brooklyn Independent Television. So my answer to his question, if I understand it, is no. I don't consider myself a role model, but I know that I have done some things and other folks have considered me a role model. So in that sense, I suppose I am. I don't think that I ever think about it in that context, you know, that I'm doing this so people can you know, see me in a certain way. I do what I think is the right thing to do. I mean, for those of us, you know, who watch the news every day, you know that the um, stop and frisk issue is a hot item. Yes. And you know that um, our organization and others, particularly our Institute for Juvenile Justice, mm -hmm. whose director is sitting here, that, that um, beautiful Asian woman sitting there in the third row is the director <laughs> of the Juvenile Justice Institute. AJ. And they have been fueling that. We have our hand all in that. Now that's a brave move to make because we are directly challenging the NYPD. It is a racist policy. Yeah. It is a policy that has been decimating our communities, has been destroying not only the future of our youth, but our longevity as a people right now is in question under this stop and frisk. Mm -hmm. And anytime the situation has gotten so bad that I have young men tell me whether they're in high school or on the streets, that when they see the police come around the corner, they just automatically get on the wall and assume the position. They don't wait for them to jump out the car. They don't, it has become so customary now that they have accepted degradation as something that they have to conform to in order to survive. We are in trouble. That's right. And so when, when we joined others in taking the stance, we knew that we would be the targets. And it's still yet to uh, play itself out because you gotta understand that stop and frisk is only just the latest tactic in an ongoing history of devices to oppress black people and other people mm -hmm. of color. This is just one of many. Right. And when mm -hmm. we attack stop and frisk, it's not really stop and frisk, it's the whole system of structural racism that we're going after, and when you do that, you become a target. So I understand that myself and members of my team are putting themselves at risk. Did I ever think about abandoning that project? No! I mean, it, I could care less what the end result is as long as I know that we're doing what is right. Somebody has to stand up, because I once heard someone said that anybody who doesn't stand for something will go for anything. Mm -hmm. And so we have to take a stand, and I think that that leads right to my next question. You want me to ask the question? Have you asked your question? I'm trying to keep track. Have you asked the question already, Devine? I think so. I think so. You're done. I, I want to know if a, young, a younger person here has a critique of what they've heard to Corey's question. Do they have a, a way of refining the question about role model? Is, is there something you're looking for that elders here can't actually articulate because they don't know that that's what you're looking for. And if you don't, it's okay. But I am gonna ask a young person to ask the next question, so. Looks like Brandon has something to say. Um, okay, my question is that, why can't we read the blueprint? As the younger generation goes on, um, the older generation tends to say that we're, we're not reading the blueprint. It's, is it in a foreign language? Why can't the younger generation <laughs> read it? Wow. Wow. I think they need reading glasses, actually. <laughs> is, the, is there a blueprint? Mm. <laughs> no. <laughs> the elders, you gotta go to the elders. Gotta go to the elders. Uh, no, there never was a blueprint as far as I know. Uh, I went through the whole civil rights struggle. I did not see a blueprint, but I just saw SNCC going in one direction and SCLC going in another direction yeah. and uh, all the various organizations uh, going in different directions, but somehow there was a feeling 
that uh, we were going toward a common goal, though some groups could do what others couldn't do. Uh, but somehow we were going toward a common goal, and I think that was an understanding. And there was more uh, speaking to each other uh, in those days. Now it's gotten to where you pass a black person on the street and maybe one out of a hundred will speak. Uh, but I'm, I'm beginning to notice very slowly that somehow that's changing, and I don't, I don't get to see that until I get out on the street, which is not often, but I get out on the street and, and, and I'm reading people, and I'm feeling that there is a, is a growing sense of, of oneness that's, uh, that black people are beginning to feel. I welcome that, and I think that's, uh, that's very good. But uh, we, we, we need to know that Homeland Security, Department of Homeland Security, has purchased 750 million rounds of hollow point bullets for Homeland Security. Not for overseas, but for here at home. And who is that directed at? You. And uh, that's already in the, in, in the works. They're already transporting caskets up to Chicago now for what's happening in Chicago today. Uh, we're in very serious times. Uh, but I don't feel, I don't see myself as a role model. I just try to do what, is, what I feel is right. I'm glad for what the brother said here about... Uh, uh, condemning the rappers and all of that. Uh, I think I would have fitted into the category of, uh, of uh, Butts and Sharpton and being more critical, but I think you said something that was very good, and that is that uh, try to understand them and work with them and co-opt them <laughs> and recognize their power. They got power. Mm -hmm. Man, they got power. But they are using it in a way that's not uplifting. Or many, I should say, have been using it in a way that's not uplifting. If they can turn that very power around and make it uplifting, that would be a great, great power in this world. Thank you. I'm gonna assert a little moderator privilege here on this to, just to add um, a, a, co a connection between Brandon's question and the response and then Kevin and Rian will jump in. Gloria Dulan Wilson wrote a piece for CMOTAP um, years ago, uh, talking about, she's a journalist, a woman of Af African ancestry, writing about the issues uh, that black people in this country struggle with. And she basically wrote a mea culpa, where she said that for younger people who were coming of age on hip hop music, and the lifestyle associated with that, whether it originated in someone's home or what they saw on TV. She said that it, it was so upsetting to her generation that they tuned out, that they condemned the young people, that they did not engage, and effectively they used the power of their moment of achieving civil rights successes as evidence that young people didn't have the same fights and the same struggles, that they had no excuses for turning their backs on the gains of that moment. And she said that was a mistake because we, we ignored the cry from the wilderness of our young people before it was commodified and taken over by the entertainment industry. And by that time, it was too late. Mm. So I think in that way, Brandon's question about the blueprint, the blueprint that should have been passed on, that should have been translated, was that you have to tell us what your challenges are in this moment, and we'll help you figure out how to politicize that work, how to learn from what worked for us. Kevin, Brian. <clears throat> wow. Um... I didn't know that there, there was no blueprint. Um, I didn't even know what a role model was when I was growing up. Um, unfortunately, like a lot of black males, there was no fathers there for me. 
you know, let's just be honest about it. Uh, we still are dealing with the legacy of slavery, you know, when many of us are suffering from post-traumatic slave syndrome, including a lot of men in our communities, and the way we were socialized in those plantations got passed from generation to generation right up to the present, where many of us think all we are are baby makers and we keep it moving. And there are good men out there. There are good men on the stage. There are good men in the audience. But I think we need to put some of this stuff in context. Why are we having conversations about where's the blueprint at? You know, why uh, uh, am I not hearing some of the things I need to know? And what ended up happening, uh, Brandon and the other young men there, many of us grew up with a lot of pain, a lot of confusion, a lot of uh, uh, questions that never get answered. And for me, I think the only things that really saved my life was that my mother stressed education so much. You know, it was stuck in my head. You got to go to school. You got to go to college. You're going to have to figure this out some way. And then when I got to school, thank God, the college, not because I went to college, but because of the black folks that were around me, I luckily discovered black history. I didn't know about Malcolm X until I was 18 years old. I didn't know. I had no idea who he was. And I can't tell you how much reading the autobiography of Malcolm X from cover to cover at 18 completely changed my life. We're talking about blueprints. Malcolm's autobiography is a blueprint. Yeah. And then that led me to other blueprints. Let me read Richard Wright's Black Boy. You know, let me read Ellison's uh, Invisible Man. Let me look at Chester Hines. Let me read the poetry of Langston Hughes. Let me begin to listen to the poetry of the last poets. Let me listen to Gil Scott Heron. Rest in peace, Gil Scott Heron. Let me listen to Still Pulse. Well, wait a minute. Who's this guy, Bob Marley? Who's Fela, et cetera? And so what I'm getting at to you and other folks out there, because I get this question all the time, is that unfortunately, I think we, gotta, we end up having to find manhood from different angles. Sometimes we have to look at a Michael Elam and say, okay, look at how this brother presents himself. I may not have a conversation with him directly, but I'm gonna study him, even if he doesn't know I'm studying him, which is why I do think whether we want to admit it or not, we have to be role models because you never know if a younger black man is looking at you. Yes, exactly. You know exactly. what I mean? How you present yourself, how you carry yourself, how you speak your conduct of behavior, because I can't tell you how many younger black males have said to me, I don't respect so-and-so who's this big time speaker talking up here because the moment he gets off stage, he's smoking a cigarette, or he's drinking liquor, he's exploiting women, et cetera. Y'all feel where I'm going with this? And so I think, when I think of blueprint, at a certain point, uh, Dr. Muhammad, I think that some of us, and I, I'm in my 40s now, it wasn't until I got to be about 35, 36, and I began looking around like, wait a minute, these 15 to 20 year old men Many younger than me are actually asking me questions now. Here I was, I didn't even grow up with a father, but I'm now forced to be in this role of a mentor and a father, and I gotta take this seriously. So I think part of our responsibility, which is why we did the Black Male Handbook a couple of years ago, the subtitle is A Blueprint for Life, is that even if we have confusions in our lives as 30 and 40 and older black males, let's be honest with the young black males and say, I hurt too, I'm in pain too, I have some confusion exactly. too, but at the least I can do is, here, don't make the same mistakes that I made. And create what Bertha Elam talked about, which is here's some safe spaces so you can figure some of your stuff out. That's the blueprint that I think a lot of us are looking for. Okay, mm. Brian. So, there, I think there are you know, those sort of examples of blueprints for our self-determination, for our liberation, for our, our healing and humanity. Um, but you know, it's, just, it's like, tell the, the, the brothers and facilities, if you don't have a plan for yourself, somebody else has a plan for you. There is definitely exactly. a blueprint for our, our right. destruction. Right. There is definitely, you know, we, uh, the Willie Lynch letter yes. said, you know, in 1712, right, the way to keep these folks from rising up and getting out of the situation, it's to keep them divided. Light skin and dark skin and this one and that Jealousy. one. And brown people bag and all, this, all these different divisions. And it, it was fact or fiction, right? The letter says it will last for at least 300 years. It's 2012. <laughs> so there's definitely, there's definitely by design, the situation that we're in is not a random by chance thing. So we need to be strategic. And we need to really pull together the best of all these blueprints. To, to, move, to, to, to move forward. And I think I was in Senegal uh, years ago and hanging out with uh, some drummers outside of the car. And, you know, I'll never forget one of the brothers, he spoke great Wolof, great French, his English was a little shaky. And I remember he said, you know, he said to this, one of the sisters I was there with on a, a scholar's trip, he said, you know, we really love you American bitches. Whoa. Wow. And we were like, oh, I, I kind of like looked at him like, you know, we were like, he, he didn't mean that, so we just ignored it. He repeated himself, no, no, I, we really love you American bitches. And I had to pull him aside, be like, brother, that's not really how you want to throw your G if you're trying to like, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> connect with the female, you know what I'm saying? So, but he was like, <laughs> 
But you know, when I looked at his collection, his music, he had Bob Marley, he didn't get it from Bob, right? <laughs> he had Big, he had Pop, you know what I'm saying? So um, the fact that what we do, the best of us and the worst of us is being deployed around the world is, you know, it's a reason for us to think about ourselves as being in a position of role models. I don't think the hip hop has gotten too successful to be used as a tool for transformation and for social change. I think the examples that we see is that it's eight to 10 songs on the radio, the 10 to 15 videos in circulation, you know, but I know so many amazing folks around the country who are not even on their radar like that, you know what I'm saying? Folks like Rob Goddess, you know what I'm saying? You know, yeah, folks like, you know, folks like, you know, the brothers with their prayers are out there, but Common, most deaf, he's a cat who we know a little bit more, but there's all these folks who are, are, are doing stuff in different ways. If we're gonna have a critique of hip hop, the culture, and even the industry, we need to, at the same time, be thinking about how do, does our work support those artists who actually embrace the values that we want to see disseminated around the world. And I, I gotta say, you know, I, I, it's, it's a, I'm blessed to be able to share some of my work with y'all today, and I've been blessed in many ways to share it around the country and around the world. But th there's, there's, there's a strange thing where like, you know, um, Jay-Z's gonna be at, the, at uh, Barclays Center in December doing eight concerts. We understand he command, has a certain amount of command. Within the values of capitalism, supply and demand, he's gonna get, receive his, you know, his fee to come to the Barclays Center. Artists, in general, who aren't at that stature, get challenged left and right just for demanding that the work be valued. You know what I'm saying? Mm. You don't go to a doctor and say, yo, can I get a surgery for, you know what I'm saying, just as a solid, you know what I'm saying? You don't go to dentists and be like, yo, homie, can you hook me up with like, you know what I'm saying, a little dental work? And the artists I'm talking about are always willing to go the extra mile, always willing to do work for, for, for free and to volunteer and, to, to, and, and do that as part of the virtue of, of who they are. But at the same time, you can't talk about, we need to see the values of community and communalism and, and, and liberation and self-determination and, and, and self put out there in a larger way, and then we don't support or value the work of the very artists that do that in our communities. You know what I'm saying? So, so that's, that's got to be part of the movement. That is so cool. Okay, so I wanted to do a little time check. We're about 45 minutes in. Um, I want to encourage, we're going to move through our remaining questions. I want to encourage the audience to write questions uh, for our Q&A period to participate in that. Um, Kalade wanted to respond, and then I want Brian you to ask your question, because Kalade, you've asked your question, right? Oh, I'm going to ask it now. Excellent. All right. <laughs> good, good, good. Um, so Brandon, Brandon doing um, sound check was asked uh, by one of the technicians to recite something continuously, and Brandon recited Invictus. He was reciting Invictus over and over again. I thought that was unique because I asked Brandon, where did he learn Invictus from? And he learned Invictus from a teacher that happened to be Greek, um, where the Alpha, Q, I'm not really sure. But I think for Brandon, uh, being a high school student, um, to him, that's a blueprint. That's the process he's looking for. And I think life is a process that, um, that entails guidelines and principles that if you align yourself with, with it, you take action to become an involved person. So I think um, my question, um, my, my response to, to, to Brandon was um, he has these individuals already at that stage that he's, that he's in that will guide him in, to the point where he becomes that fully involved individual. But um, when I look in the black community and uh, when I look at black males especially, I haven't seen a process that we all embody collectively that evolves us mm -hmm. together. So I'm interested in from the group and the elders around is there a process that us as black males, us in the black community, when you look at other communities, whether it's the Jewish community, and when you look at, uh, when you look at uh, other cultures and religion, is there a process, a guideline, a principle, that if we follow and align ourselves with it and take specific actions, we all become a better individual? This individual that we're talking about, being a global citizen and really giving back to your, to your community. Is there something that black men need to model that is evident in other communities, non-black male communities that have been successful? I think is Kaladi's question, right? Yeah. yeah. Brandon? Oh. Well, there's one thing that I see a lot is that in a black male, I see like some of them that just give up a lot and they give up like during the easy things. So, 
I think if more black men don't give up so easily and settle for less, us as kids will reflect on that and show that the, we need more hardworking black men and we need more people that will sit there and actually um, tell another person how they feel instead of using violence and disrespecting one another. I just think that as for a person to be a leader is that they need to show the the respect to each other and to themselves. Um, I think to build off on what you said, there's a problem because we're sitting here and speaking about it, and there's people here watching, but there are so many people, like, like I see people in my neighborhood who are just sitting and waiting. We're not sitting and waiting. We're being proactive, and I think, and it baffles me because... Like, I really just don't understand, like, who, why do you sit and, like, why do you sit and wait? I don't mean to ask another question, but, like, and it probably doesn't apply to any of us here, anyone in this room, but why do black men sit and wait? Why do, like, why? Why, why can't they just be proactive the same way that we're doing? Because we can all sit here and be examples to them, but they're not here to see because they're waiting for a blueprint instead of looking for it. Because I didn't sit, my mom didn't let me sit and wait for someone to tell me what to do. When I, when I was young, I told her, that I want to do this. Like, let me take a photography class, let me dance, let me do this. It wasn't her telling me what to do, and I think that that was my blueprint. Like, just her allowing me to really be free and figure out what I want to do. And there are so many people who don't have that. They don't, they don't have the not only the initiative, but also the resources to, to do something, to do something, anything. And I think that, to go back to the beginning of this conversation, the reason why programs in the arts help more than, say, like a basketball program is because you don't have to be Tara Walker or Hank Willis Thomas to be... To be to be a working artist, there's a difference between being a working artist and there's a difference between, like, there's a difference between being a working artist and art stardom. And being able to create something is more invigorating and more tangible than just, like, wait, sitting and waiting. Check. This might, this might shift it a little bit, but my, my question something that I'm, I'm, de I'm dealing with right now. I'm just doing a lot of research on, on why uh, marriages, why marriages are successful or not successful. And being I got a group of different men. My question is, um, why is it so difficult to remain ex sexually exclusive with one woman? You know, is it, is it, uh, if, if you're what? If you're heterosexual, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. I, I'm making the assumption that um, this question is, like I said, it's kind of personal, and um, uh, that's why I'm asking it in this way, so for all due respect to everybody in the room. <laughs> it's the same gender loving. And you, did you tell me to ask, <laughs> <laughs> you tell me to ask the question? Answer the question? <laughs> no, no, I just, I, I just, um, I, 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 I realize that we make the assumption that everybody's heterosexual sometimes. So I'm trying, like I told you backstage, I'm trying to be more aware, but my question is, is personal. And I'm just curious as old, older brothers on the panel, or even same age brothers, um, it's, it's obvious that this is a big challenge in our communities and I'm just curious, um, why, is, is it societal? Is it, our bio, you know, is it in our biology? Or you know, why is it so difficult to um, remain as, I mean, I, I, think, I think the first teacher is usually, like everybody is identified, it starts at home. I think humans innately uh, resemble things that they're around. Uh, it's the argument of nature versus nurture. I think what's celebrated around a lot of black males, and even when I first came to the States, um, being part of a fraternity, uh, we tend to celebrate the men going out to conquer. And your, our definition of conquering when it comes to relationship, does not entail being committed and faithful to one individual. It entails um, you receiving um, accolades and receiving recognition and significance from external 
um, like from external uh, remarks. So I think uh, to, to answer the question about relationships and having healthy relationships, um, questions about marriage and being committed in a marriage and having faith and hope, goes back to the first question all the brothers on the panel has talked about, which essentially is the, the whole know thyself. I think it, the, the notion of spirituality and mm -hmm. oneness and being in line with uh, the divine order, uh, when you start experiencing relationships, uh, it's important that you experience it at a very mature stage and you're doing it for yourself and that individual. So um, it's a question that I've been troubled with. I uh, struggled with that question still, but I think it's important that um, we address it and again, identify guidelines that will help younger males and even males in relationships to stay committed to whoever they're with. Post-slavery traumatic disorder yes. is a contributing factor. Yes, we were not allowed to have relationships and so when you have a man and a woman turn into breeders, that, D, that carries into the DNA. Because that's part of the issue. That's part of the issue. Not only that is empowerment. I mean, a black man, other than, you know, we have a, a man in the White House. But before that, you know, a black man, his power was his sexuality. And when you hold on to that and, and raise it as a trophy and hold on to it and, and, you, and, 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 and divorce yourself or taught to divorce yourself from spirituality and sexuality. Because spirituality and sexuality are on the same coin, the two different sides. And when you devalue your own sexuality, that's, you devalue everybody else's. And so when you don't care about yourself, it's not just about why you can't be faithful, it's just about what's going on inside you. You know, what's going on, what's going on inside of a man who has 30 children, is 33 years old, had 30 children by 11 women, and can't pay child support? There's a problem with him inside. And so we have to really examine ourselves, we have to look at the history of human sexuality, and we have to know sexuality beyond uh, what I can do, but look at it, uh, stop looking at it, and stop having conversations as if we're in the backyard. Adolescent sexuality doesn't help in our, in our development. And so we need to learn how to have relationships. We need to learn how to be committed. We need to learn how to value ourselves. Because if you don't start with yourself, you will mess up every other person in this community. Watch this and other Brooklyn Independent Television episodes online at brickartsmedia.org slash BIT.